Mm. Well, everyone, welcome to another month of Q&A at IFAST University with Bill Hartman. The topic this month, we're trying out a topical month Q&A. Uh, topic this month is building strength. I wanted to say strength because I didn't figure we needed to go into uh, max strength exactly, but uh, I imagine with given an hour, we'll, we'll touch on it and maybe we can talk about applying strength in a few different contexts, different sports, compare positions, um, all sorts of stuff. So, Bill, do you have any opening remarks? No. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm much better working off of a question. It, it's because I, I have no idea what's of interest, but, but uh, uh, and, and we've got a lot of really good brains on this call. So, so let's take advantage of that. Let's not, I mean, I realize that you threw my name out there, but the reality is, is like you've got some, some very practiced human beings on this call. So let's, let's spread the wealth a bit because I think that if there's, if there's one thing in regards to whatever this term of strength means, it's, it's become so vague to me. Um, I think that, that everybody's going to have a, a, a valuable contribution because there are so few rules in regards to, um, you know, what, what really matters because um, th th there's going to be like the commonality, obviously, of of the application of some form of stress. But when you're talking about an output from a muscle or muscles or the body or context, I mean, all of that stuff influences whatever this outcome is going to be, you know. So, you know, if you talk about a power lifter, he's going to think of strength in, in one way. If you talk about you know, talk to a track coach, he's going to talk about a strength in another way. If you talk to a basketball uh, performance coach, they're going to talk about strength in another way. And then and the number of uses is, is so broad. Like I said, let's, let's take advantage of everybody that we've got on the call. How was that for an opening statement? I like that. I like that. Put the onus on everyone else, make them drive this. That's good. Should this I is, put someone on the spot or wait for a volunteer as tribute? This is not my first rodeo, Lance Quickly. I know Rufus is going to have a question. I mean, yeah. I was going to pick on Rufus too, so <laughs> I think we agree. He always has one. He's always thinking. I hate that. What's going? On? What's up, Ruf? Um, about what we talked about the other day. What is what is strength? I mean, how do you define it or how do you know you have enough of it or whatever? I, I, my first response is always going to be, I don't know, because I, it, again, I think, I think that the, the, the term strength as we have gotten whatever understanding that we do have, um, it's it's become so context dependent um, with so many potential influences because of the perspective that we have now. So, so um, if we can go back, you know, 30 years um, and, and just use my, my own perspective as an example, because it's the only one I have, um, it was it was very simple. It's like you induced a a stress, and then the body responded, and then you immediately got stronger. And then now we have any number of systems that are an influence. We have the nervous system, which we never really talked about, other than from a from a muscle recruitment and rate coding and intramuscular coordination standpoint. But the reality is this is is you know if I come in feeling crappy after you know a a bad night of sleep or I had a fight with my wife, um, I'm weaker. Um, when I, when I speak relatively in, in the, in gym numbers, right? So does that mean that I am weaker or is it just that, um, it, it's just a, a, a cumulative output. Is it a cumulative expression of something? And then, um, you know, who are we talking about? It's kind of like I said, it's like we talk about a power lifter, like what is, what is strength? Well, there's your bench, your squat, your deadlift. And then maybe your, your 
auxiliary lifts that support those. And maybe that's what strength is. But for an Olympic weightlifter, maybe it's something else, right? So again, I, I don't know if we have this, this clear definition as, as easy it would be to pick up super training and read chapter one where, where SIF goes through all the different variations of strength from maximal to starting to accelerative and et cetera, et cetera. You know, we have all these supposed measures and, and, and such, but the reality is I don't know if we, if we're really talking about just some sort of is strength become this generic term, you know, because we have force that, that we can talk about from, from a, a physics standpoint, we talk about force, but is, is lifting more weight in the gym equivalent to producing more force. And I don't think that's the case. And we've seen it right. When we're measuring training velocities and such, we'll see forces that are higher at, at a lower percentage of one RM than they are at, at near maximal one RM. So again, it, are, are we talking about force? Or are we talking about chasing a number in the gym? So I don't know if that was very helpful, but, but I think it's just a vague. I think it's just a vague concept that, that requires a lot of context to be defined and and a lot of individual individualization to be defined. I don't think we can just say that this is strength. So, what should we be chasing if it's not a number in the weight room? Well, okay. So, I mean. I, I understand where you're going to go here, but yeah. go ahead, keep going. No, well, no, I'm just curious if, you know, if, if, you know, are we chasing the rate of force development or just force development? Isn't that what the, what the separate speed or strength uh, categories kind of does? I mean, it's not necessarily chasing maximal strength, is it? Well, I don't think so. I don't know how valuable that is. Like, how do you know when you're strong enough to do X, right? Right, I mean, yeah. So, so what is the official um, perfect representative bench press for a left guard in the NFL? Like, like what, what, are, what are we shooting? Yeah, exactly. It's like, what, what determines how well he performs? Like, we don't know. We don't have a number for that. Right. Right. right? And, and nor, I mean, and again, it's like, so you have to make that call, right? As far as chasing a number that is representative of enough. Right. And, and then you hope that that's somehow, if we're talking about some form of athlete, then you hope that that, that provides some element of support to their, to their performance. And, and by somehow improving that number or whatever, that's going to buy you, you know, a, a higher level of performance. So anybody else? I don't want to hog the whole thing. Um, so we should be chasing a a specific category for the sport, then. Well, you, you want to you want to support the demands of of the activity as much as possible, whether we can or whether we can. I, I think that's what we're trying to do. Right. Jim, hey, Blair. Blair. I was saying it's good. I, we're we're on a call, dude. I, I see that. Um, <laughs> I'm on the call too. Oh, okay. Um, Welcome. I, I think just to kind of give my perspective on things, I think the thing that I use strength for is to see what position that person demonstrates that strength in, um, what strategy they have to use in order to uh, de demonstrate strength. I think that gives me kind of some insight. Um, you know, I had a wrestling kid that came in here who had been working with somebody for like, several years young kid like 15 he'd been deadlifting like three times a week i mean he was so extended it was ridiculous like he could fit a foam roller on his under his back when he came in and that was his only strategy and obviously he didn't move very well he couldn't he could overpower people but he couldn't shoot he couldn't move well so you know working on getting him some variability in that but really you know when i first started out everything was about is how heavy you could lift and I was lucky to have some good coaches that also put a lot of things like bear crawls and hurdles and things like that to get people to move as well. So, you know, and I think we've talked about this before is, you know, if you strengthen a bad, like a, a position that isn't optimal for the sport, um, you know, it's going to lead to, to issues. So it can actually be a detriment in some cases. 
Yeah, I, I, and again, it's like I, I think you like your the initial part of your statement was was the fact that you're talking about an individual and you're talking about context. It's like yeah. you know it, the the where and the when uh, probably has a lot more to do with what you're going to chase. Yeah. And, and the who, obviously, uh, what you're going to chase, um, or what it should be, let's put it that way, right? right. And, and again, I think that the, the team sports training makes it a little bit more difficult just because you got so many, so many people that you're working with. A lot of us work with individuals, and I think that provides an advantage in regards to, yeah. to, to all well, these. Well, and then also, like in my football career, you know, there were guys that could lift the whole weight room, but they got on the football field, they couldn't apply it. You know, they, they couldn't apply it to the sport. Right. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of football programs that I know of that, you know, they're chasing these numbers and it really doesn't have anything to do with, with football. It, it you know, they're, they're not power lifters. They're not, they're not weightlifters. So it's, uh, right. you know, a lot of it's just smoke and mirrors, but I mean, the one thing adding strength does do is help with adding hypertrophy and muscle mass. You know, some of these kids that I work with are just so, you know, they just don't have any size, you know, so that, that's something that, that adding some rational strength can help with you know adding muscle mass um so you know you can't flex bones so i think that's something that is is important but i think there's way too much emphasis put on you know maximal strength or uh you know in strength and conditioning in general and once again it's all the context is totally individual yeah but it, but it's the measurable that's why it's so popular right so what do we do how do we how do let me throw a question out to the group then since we've got good brains here how do we make it useful what what are we what are we really trying to do then? And and again, I, I, I let's pick a context and let's just talk about that. So we have something that's applicable rather than just sitting here and waxing, you know, over philosophy of oh, this vague term and, and you know, we need context and such. Let's pick one and let's you know, let's figure it out. Let's figure out what we're trying to do here. Lance you know. Bill there was uh some Charlie Francis quote that I heard in one of his videos, maybe the Vancouver series, he, he says something about Ben Johnson squatting five or 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. And he said, we never went under six reps because he didn't need any more strength. Right. Do you, could you maybe offer more perspective on that? Like, how does he determine that? Well, so Again, it's like you can you can see these things, and and keep in mind that that you're you're talking about a, a coach and a and an athlete with a long term relationship. So they were tracking numbers over a very very long time. So it's not hard to see the trends when, when you're you're collecting information over an extended period of time and say, okay, so if, is another hundred pounds on his squat going to do anything to enhance his performance in another realm? It's like, so what we're, what we're doing in the weight room is support is typically, typically supportive of, of some other activity. And so again, does, does me improving a, a squat number definitely enhance the, the output in, in a sprint or in agility or a throw. And, and again, that's, so we can't say yes, we can't say no, we just have to track numbers over time. And I think that's a big deal. Uh, you know, and, and no matter who we're talking about and how we're making a decision, because the, the bottom line is, like I said before, we have so many potential influences that affect the outcome of the situation we just don't know what that answer will be. We have history that informs us, but the ultimate decisions are, are much more agile in regards to what we're, what we're going to do, right? And so once I achieve a certain level of strength, however we're measuring that, then maybe it's just a matter of making sure that my system can output that, that degree of effort and maybe that's my modulator that takes the brakes off of my nervous system and allows me to run a little bit faster or allows me to tolerate a little bit more stress or allows me to gain a little bit more position where anything further just doesn't, doesn't provide that, that enhancement. Do you think you can look at it from like solely a bioenergetics perspective and say, he's going to run, no, I mean, at least 10 seconds, right? So if he does a single, he's probably not taking 10 seconds to do that single. So 
maybe just from a time under tension fatigue standpoint, six reps makes more sense for him. I mean, maybe there's an element of that, right? But again, it's like, okay, so how many sets of six, right? And how many, how many, how many, how much frequency are we talking about over time? There's so many parameters there that are, that are potential influences, you know, from a programming standpoint. And again, I think that's, that's why, you know, we have a longer term relationship and you're working individually with an athlete. There's, there's these huge advantages of being able to track numbers over time. And so, you know, the, the people that work in the private sector have a very similar uh, approach in many cases where you, you might have a, a four week program that you wrote for a client, but you're always making those adjustments on the fly. Oh, okay. You know what? You had a big meeting and you crappy sleep and you missed a meal. Let's, let's, you know, let's bring your volume down or let's, let's adjust the intensity. We'll keep your rep range and we'll adjust the intensity. I mean, there's so many influences and there's so many ways to manipulate a program that, that you can do it on the fly to, to a great degree. And then you have to, <clears throat> take your experience into consideration and then take as, as much of this cumulative information that, that you can acquire. And then you have to make a decision and then you have to intervene and then you have to see what happens. And that's unfortunate because we just don't, we, we don't always know what's coming out the back end, so to speak. How's that Lance? Can you hear me? You're just sitting there smiling. You're taking notes, aren't you? It's good. I'm trying to keep track of everything. Yes. Okay. I'm yeah. also trying to get you to make claims and be specific and stuff. <laughs> make yeah, claims. instead of saying it all depends. That's <laughs> well, what I love that. I love but that. But it does. It does. No, I, mean, I, I agree with you. I'm trying you to know, think of like specific things in my head. I think I got yeah. one. Okay. Because people um, want people want a cookbook and they want they want black and white answers. They want yeses and noes. And that was my dog, sorry. Yeah. Uh, they want yeses and nos and, and they want absolutes because they, they want a rule book and they want a manual and there aren't any. Right. Right. There's no PowerPoint for this. There's no manual for this. There are there is history which informs us. And then we have to apply and then we have to see what happens. Um, welcome to the real world. Right. You know, we can talk about the Russian manuals all we want, but but what they did is like they wrote those after all these programs were completed and they saw the outcomes. They said, well, here's what works, right? And then, okay, it worked for those guys. And, and so if you live there and you coach the way they do and you live the way they do and, and you know, whatever enhancements that you are provided at, at the time, that contributes to the outcome. And so again, we can't use those as a rule book. We can use those as information to allow us to make good decisions. So fire away. Sorry, Chris. Uh, yeah. So the classic uh, thought process of taking athletes and doing like reactive strength indexes and realizing that one athlete is more reactive or elastic and they need more strength or one athlete is more strong and mm -hmm. they need to be more elastic. Do you think that that type of thought process, uh, I mean, what's your thought on that sort of thinking? I think there's elements that you can influence in a good way using that concept. And I think there's elephant, there's elements that you will not change. Um, when you look at, at physical structure of a human being and you have these relationships and in, in, in regards to how we move and, and, and we've had this conversation between us in the past, it's like, if, if I have a certain, uh, rib cage or, or thorax to pelvic circumference ratio, I move a very specific way because there's only one way the physics is going to let me do that. And, and so I can't change that part in many cases. I can maybe enhance it to a certain degree, but basically you're going to work with the tools that you have and um, the strategy that I may use to create this, 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 um, change in the way that you can produce these reactive uh, movements, um, you know, may be a little bit different than, you know, if I'm looking, looking at a six foot nine basketball player and a five foot nine female volleyball player, you know, they, they both need, you know, certain jumping capabilities, but their physical structures are going to be radically different. And, and so for me to try to enhance an element of that, I might have to use a totally different strategy Whereas maybe the, the basketball player, I can use an external load. Maybe for the, the female volleyball player, maybe I need to take load away and, and to, to get that same outcome. 
And, and again, this is just trying to use the information that we have provided to us, trying to understand how this, this human being uses their body to move, you know, con considering the internal forces and the external forces. And then we, we come up with this decision that way. So, so to make a long story short, yeah, we could probably influence that, but I don't think the strategies are as clean cut as, as we would think they are. It's not, it's not a matter of like, oh, she needs more strength because she's bouncier. Right. I don't know if that's the case in, in, in every respect. Um, but again, you, you make a decision based on your understanding, based on your knowledge base and based on the information that we do have available, you apply an intervention and you measure what happens. And then that furthers your decision making along this, this agile path that you need to follow. So I'm kind of, I'm oh, sorry. Do you wanna, you can go ahead, Campo. All right, I'm probably gonna be shut down pretty quick on this one anyway. Um, loading for a general population client. Uh-huh. Is there any efficacy to that then? Like say, all right, so sure, we have an infinite number of ways within an external context or on, on the sporting field or in the outside environment we have a numerous number of ways where we can define strength, but we have a finite number of ways to do it within a clinic or a weight room. So with that being said, is there any um, merit to loading these finite number of exercises linearly? You know, I, I take a beginner, I show them how to squat. Do I even bother loading that squat then? Or are we going to be all vague on, oh, well, do you need to get quote unquote strong? Like what is, what is strong for a general population client then? Mm -hmm. So is this somebody that we just met or is this somebody that we've been working with for a year? Um, in my you, context, someone I just met. Okay. So, but, but you can, you can immediately see the difference, right? That, that I, I have no knowledge of this human being at all. So my strategy is going to be different. It's going to be error on the side of caution. It's going to be defaulting to the simplest, easiest strategy, right? Because I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea how this person reacts. Um, and so I might be more concerned about a qualitative approach where, where it's, it's pleasant to my, to my eyes to see them move effectively versus let's slap another 20 pounds in the bar. Whereas if I've got a guy that I've been working with for a year and I've seen the ups and downs and I've seen him come in on a Wednesday after a late Tuesday meeting. And I I've got an idea of how from a, from a, a cognitive and a psychological perspective, he reacts to those things. Now I have a lot more information as to how I want to make my decision in regards to load. Both of these people take advantage of the of the external loading in regards to their ability to tolerate all stressors, right? Because we have this this allostatic model now, and and so I think there's a tremendous benefit to loading the general population because if if I can make somebody more resistant to any kind of stress, then then chances are there's less impact from an overall health perspective. So then now our, our goal is still to continue to apply greater and greater loads to them, right? Sure. Then what would be, because we throw this question around of like, what is strong enough? What is strong enough for this general population client? When do, when do I say like, okay, enough linear loading then that I'm satisfied with the point in which we're at? So it, it, especially with general population, I, I think that that's a conversation that you have and you say like, you know, where do you want to end up? Most people, when they come, come to see you, they're, they're either concerned about being comfortable with their body, whether that be in movement or in general appearance. And so what allows you to, to achieve that? Can you, can you achieve muscular hypertrophy without increases in strength? Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, while there is a relationship between cross-sectional area and, and, and force production that we know of, um, there's also elements where you'll, you'll see you know, that, that relationship deviate where you can get hypertrophy and not see the, the, the gains in strength that you would typically see. So <laughs> yeah, physics, exactly. Um, uh, so th this might not be another 
it's pertinent to loading and max strength, but you know, you get a client that comes in and they say, I, I want to get stronger. And then I try to have them uh, funnel that definition of like what stronger means for them. Do you have any strategies as far as, you know, taking their concept of what strong is and putting it into action? Mm -hmm. So you, you just, you, you keep asking for what, right? Like why, why, why is this important to you? How would it, how would it represent, how would you represent it right now? And then that's going to provide you an element of guidance in regards to, you know, the exercises that you select. So some people, you know, they just want to be able to pick up heavy things and, and, and then some guys want to, you know, work on a specific lift. You know, we've got, you know, a few, few guys in the, in the, the, that come in in the late hours that, you know, they're going to come in and they, they just want to kill a bench press. And, and then, then a lot of the decisions that are made in that regard have to become protective so they don't destroy themselves. Right. Cause I, I want them to be successful. I want them to be pleased with their, with their outcomes, but I also know that there's going to be negative side effects associated with that. And so, so sometimes you have to, to kind of reel them in. And so again, those are decision makers as well. I'd say it's not just about driving somebody unilaterally in, in one direction. It's like, okay, what are the, what are the bad side, you know, the bad sides to, to uh, uh, doing this, this much or this often at this intensity and, and then how do I best protect them? Right. Okay. Allison, you're up. Thank you. That's actually a pretty good leeway into what I was going to ask about as well. Um, so I've, I've been exploring similar things to what Campbell mentioned with Gen Pop. I don't really work with athletes anymore. So um, I've been, you know, working people towards their goals, trying to give them what they want and what I think that they could use, um, increase their capability to tolerate allostatic load and everything. Um, but I don't know where I can test them. I can test movements to see that those get better. Um, but for stress with them, unless I'm testing like a sprint, which I've started doing with some people, um, some of them it's, I look at their sprint and I'm like, maybe we should work on sprinting mechanics before we address your other me like strength mechanics or whatever. Um, but I don't, it's not necessary for them. It's not like I'm trying to get them to sprint as fast as possible. I just right. want them to be able to tolerate stress. Right. So how can I, do you think measuring or finding a way to track outside how they feel would be more beneficial than tracking numbers inside the gym for general population? It, so especially with the general population, it's always going to matter, right? I mean, one of, the, one of the best monitoring systems that you could ever use with anybody, whether we're talking about a high level athlete or, or your general pop client is when they come in and you give them a fist bump, you say, how you doing? You know, and then um, a guy by the name of Tom Inkledon, very, very, very intelligent human being, um, used to talk about the facial freshness scale. And so, so the guys around the gym have heard me talk about this and it's like a, a scale from one to five and you can just kind of see people's face when they walk in that, uh, you know, if their eyes are bloodshot and their face is all puffy and uh, you know, they're, they're kind of scary white looking and you give them like a, a one or a two on the facial freshness scale, you kind of know it's not going to be a great workout. And then you see the, some, the, the next person come in and they got the big bright eyes, they got a big smile on their face and they look totally refreshed and then they come in. And, and so little things like that. So, so there's, there's elements that you can perceive in, the, in this person. And so, you know, just their general physical appearance, their, the way that they move, the way they interact is going to provide you an element of decision-making. Um, they're, they're, ability to execute technique. So again, you, you have a role in this and then they have a role as well. How hard was that lift for you today? There's your measuring stick, right? So you use, you use a rating of perceived exertion on a regular basis, whether you do it um, acutely in the moment. So you take your rating of technique and then you take their rating of perceived exertion and then that decides the next set, right? So we talk about you know, progressive resistance exercise, or we want to talk about auto-regulatory measures, that's the best way to do it. So as a coach, you have, a, you have a, a defined model in your head. It should look like this when you do this lift. 
And then you say, okay, where did they fall on my technique scale? And it doesn't require a number or anything like that. It's just like, was it good enough? Did it look safe? Okay, I liked that one. How did that feel to you? Oh yeah, that was like only like a six out of 10. All right, let's put a little bit more weight on the bar and let's see what happens. Now, does technique change under those circumstances? Does their perceived exertion change under those circumstances? And so that, that's your ongoing measuring stick. So if I, if I can track that even just you know, periodically, then I can, I can see, oh, this person's tolerating more stress because the rating of perceived exertion kind of stays the same, but their numbers are going up on their, their favorite lifts. So that's a, probably a good representation for you as a coach to say, okay, this program is working towards what I want and what they want, right? And then you hope that, that you know, you're, you're hitting as many of those, those possible goals that they have and you don't want to try to minimize those just as a, as a recommendation because you get them too spread out on too many things, you're not going to be good at anything. Um, so, so again, I think you've always got a measuring tool. I don't think you have to turn it into like, oh, we're going to vertical jump everybody before they walk in before they come in for their workout. And you can do that. And under certain circumstances, I think it's very reasonable to, to try to use something like that from a consistency standpoint. But, but the bottom line is, it's like you, you've got a lot of tools you know, that you can use with this population. You just got to understand you know, what, what, what those tools really are. We, we tend to get like bogged down with, with these absolutes and like trying to write down a number when the reality is it's like, oh, you know, Karen doesn't look so good today. So I'm going to probably take it easier on her. And then maybe she shows up and then, you know, she kills it anyway, but, but you make that adjustment on the fly and then just track it over time because the collecting data over time is the better decision maker in regards to any kind of monitoring that I've ever seen. So the, that all makes sense. Um, I guess part of the issue that I'm still having though is when I have people, especially with the population that I work with in the tech industry where, you know, it, it fluctuates very frequently in how people work in their scheduling. Mm -hmm. So it really is like a week to week basis. Like he might have a really good week and then the next two weeks he's crushed. He's not sleeping well. His kid's been sick. He's got a cold and I can't prolong my tracking. We make a lot of progress in two weeks and then he has one or two weeks where he gets sick and I have to question, well, is, what I'm doing affecting him? Is that affecting him? Am I pushing him too hard? How can I track this more efficiently with mm -hmm. so much fluctuation? Because now rate of perceived exertion is going to change if he catches a cold every three weeks because he has sure. a baby at home. It sure is. But, but what, what's the one element of that lifestyle that you just described that you can control? His, his working out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like his kids aren't going to go away. His cold is going to go away when it decides to go away. His work schedule is, is relatively uh, driven by what he does for a living. You can't manipulate any of those things, but take the one thing that you have power over and then you provide him what is the reasonable element. And that means that it's like, you know what, today you're going to get on the stationary bike and we're just going to pedal slowly for 20 minutes and we're going to have a really deep conversation about your goals. And maybe that's today's workout because that's what he needs. And then it provides you beneficial information and then you didn't kill him. And then maybe you enhance some element of his ability to, to, to recover. Right. And so again, you, you, you have, you have a lot of power in this situation, right. But, you know, just because you didn't kill somebody for your work for their workout doesn't mean that, that it wasn't an effective workout. And you need to explain that to the client as well. It's like, you say, look, here's the dealio. I need you to get healthy. And you know what, if I bury you with, with heavy deadlifts today, I got a bad feeling that, that we're just going to make this worse. And then you're going to take this bad attitude home and then who knows what's going to happen, right? So again, you, you're erring on the side of caution. You're protecting your client. You're probably doing something that they, that they um, probably need versus, versus want. But, but the reality is, it's like you're the one thing in his lifestyle that can be manipulated to meet whatever the current need is. You have agility. In, in your decision making, whereas, okay, if he's got a work deadline, that ain't going away. Like I said, junior, junior at home ain't going to go away. So, so you gotta, you've got to be willing to do that. And that's what makes you a good coach. When you can tell somebody that kind of thing and, and you develop that element of trust, and then they're, they're coming back to you and then they keep referring people to you. Yeah. Figuring out how to incorporate that 
that kind of tracking into their strength tracking is mm -hmm. is challenging. So there's a couple ways to do that, right? Like you said, acutely you can do it as as you're training, right? So you ask them how hard was that, and okay, so you have a rating of uh, perceived exertion, and then you have your rating of technique, and those two two things make the acute decisions. Then you take uh, the, like the primary lifts, like whatever, like usually have like a big lift in a workout, right? Or something like that. You take a primary lift and you take the, the, the load volume. So sets times reps times load. You multiply that times a weekly RPE where you catch them at the, on the last workout of the week. And you say, how hard was it this week? And they go, oh man, it was a seven. So then I multiply those loads times seven. And now I have a, a number. And then the next week I do the same thing. And then I just see, okay, well, what was my total load? So his perceived exertion, right, covers his cognitive, psychological, and emotional side. And then the, the load volume will tell you how hard he actually worked relative to whatever he was doing the week before. And then they, now you have a fixed number that you can plot on a graph over time. And you can say, wow, this is really working, or this is where he got sick. And so um, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, an example. Uh, at uh, the um, Boston Sports Medicine Group thing a few years ago, Bill Sands, <clears throat> who was in charge of the uh, uh, recovery and restoration for the U.S. Olympic Committee, uh, gave gave a talk. And this is this is before we had all these cool gadgets that everybody wears and stuff. And and but what they did is they did this really detailed questionnaire that every athlete filled out every day, and and literally they tracked things over time. And he and he put up like real life examples and it looks like a sat test with the filling in the circles kind of thing but you can see him tracking over time and he would he you could see that their performance is dropping off and it goes here's where they got sick dot 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 you should drop off here's where they got hurt and then there was one girl where they went dot 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 and it dropped off very very sharply and then she had no measures after that and that was a career ender right so again just looking at, at data over time and and you have to select parameters that that are easy for you to implement with the general pop because they don't want to sit there and answer 20 questions every time they come into the gym. But hey, how you doing? Oh, great. So so great might be a seven. And then you say, well, what's your facial freshness? What, how do they look today? Right? Are they talkative? And, and so you, you make a guesstimate there and then you look at your gym numbers and you just make a comparison. You know, and I think we try to overcomplicate things too much. And, and we just try to do something that's simple and consistent and, and somewhat measurable and useful, right? It, the, the degree of, of, of absolution as to how impactful some of these things are, I, I just don't know what, what the value is, but we just need something that's useful. And I think that that's, that's very reasonable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can those, uh, you know, like the facial facial in indicators you talk about and different mm -hmm. things, can they can they change in the workout? I don't see why not. I mean, could that could that make the workout all of a sudden go better or? <clears throat> do you ever have somebody? Do you ever have somebody come in and say, "Man, I feel lousy," and then they warm up and then they PR? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's like you tell you where the grain is all right. Again, it's like these are not. Absolutely, we're dealing with humans, and that makes everything more complex. It would be really nice if we said, you know what, if you lift a 75% load eight times for three sets, um, you're going to get this response, and we just don't know that. We just don't know what that response is going to be. Allison, I, I posted a link in the uh, group chat to Brian Mann's um, dissertation on APRE. It uh, gives oh, you some you parameters, go. gives you some parameters to use mm -hmm. for what you should do to adjust. It's a little more like systematic. What Bill's saying is important uh, with GenPop because I work a lot with those people as well. And like that facial test is a good one, like shaking people's hands. Um, I usually try to go based off of what their perceived exertion is, what my perception of their exertion is, and then what the numbers are saying. And then I use those three things to kind of extrapolate out what I should be doing on any given day. Right, right. Um, the, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen um, Brian's a APRE article, but 
there's actually a very simplistic example of, of auto regulatory progressive resistance exercise in super training. And, and I get the, there's a, it's a graphical representation where it says on this set, here's what happened, this set, here's what happened. And then here's the decision that you make based on this outcome. And so again, there are ways to do this. And, and again, I think, especially with the gen pop, we, we have to be able to make these changes on the fly. The worst case scenario is to, is to say that this program is gold and it's not gonna change because you just don't know. There's just too many influences. So, cool. Bill, unless anyone else has a question. Yeah. Campo. Does anyone else have a question? Okay. What are you um, so, based on just the relativity of RPE, mm -hmm. I've participated in programs and I've also programmed this where people would achieve a five rep max or a three rep max within the primary lift that they're completing. And then they're utilizing that number to base the intensity for that session. Absolutely. Now, is that is that something that should be utilized more often to program for intensity, especially in like team settings or other settings where we don't have access to all this crazy technology, as well as, I mean, especially in a team setting where you can't really be as agile with something like an RPE, because you well, might but, have but, 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 so, so, yeah, yeah. Um, what, what you're actually doing is, is you're sort of testing the recovery in that regard. And so this is what I do with people that I work with at a distance because I can't be there to manipulate their parameters. And, and so I always build a buffer into the, the loading parameters. So I, so I try to, to control that as much as possible. But what I'll say is, it's like, okay, so you're going to use a five RM load. You're going to do three reps until you can't do threes. And, and that gives me um, an, an accumulation of volume because most people want some level of hypertrophy to, to go with this. So I need to accumulate enough volume so, so I can do that. And then, um, but this is how I modulate the intensity. So on, you know, week one, they might come in and let's just say that they're, they're benching 185 for five and they do their triples there. And then the next week they come in, they're feeling great. And so they're, they're, they work up to their first set of, they do a set of five. And so they're going to measure their recovery. It's like, how did you do? And then they go 190 and then they do their threes there. And so again, so, so, so they've in, improved their stress tolerance or their, their, their systematic or systemic output. And so now they're training it at whatever quote unquote optimum level that might be, whether it's optimum or not, there's a question mark, of course, but it does give us a measurable to use as a guide. Right, we, we, we have provided them a level of information. Hey, Ruth, um, uh, the Bulgarian system was based on the same kind of concept. concept. Was it? They would come in for a training max and then they would base all their percentages off the training max, correct? Right, they're, yeah, they're just trying to test their recovery. And so they, they, they would go to max on the classical lifts and any assistance lifts and then uh, squats and so that's, and then they would tell them, okay, you're going to go to 80% for how many sets and reps or 90%, whatever it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. yeah so, so, so they're doing the same thing. I mean, they're just adapting, they're adapting the daily workout to whatever this individual's recovery capabilities are at the time. And so again, is it right? Is it wrong? It's, it's, it's probably more right than wrong. Um, in, in, in regards to its usefulness, and to provide an element of, of guidance and control. But like I said, I still, I still build a buffer into it um, just as a, as a precaution if I'm not standing there watching them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill, I'm gonna make a, a loaded statement since you know I'm the king of loaded statements and questions. <laughs> um, with you, with you, kids not playing, with, pardon me? Are you invisible now? I'm invisible. I'm, I'm really taking my circadian biology seriously these days. Okay. Oh, I um, see you. There you go. <laughs> Oops, sorry. So with kids not playing outside anymore and with the human organism becoming more of a zoo animal, being less resilient, not having, you know, good capacity, uh, zero next to no GPP at all, um, I just kind of wanted to get your commentary on how the industry is going to have to change. 
I mean, I know how I've changed already, but how the industry's have to going to have to change and how, um, you know, what we're going to have to do as professionals to basically do damage control. Cause I really don't think we can make up for the fact that people don't work outside anymore and kids don't play outside anymore. Like what is that going to look like in 10 or 15 years? I have no idea, but, but I think that, um, um, one of the things that we're doing specifically with the athletic development is, is a, we become an element of, of the gym class that they don't get anymore. Right. And, and, so we're, we're trying to develop athletes, but we're also looking at the other, other elements. So, and Rufus is the, is the, the godfather of this one. Talk about integrating play into the workout and such. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, that's a, a huge element. Kids don't play and saying, <laughs> my favorite, I, I should probably let Rufus tell you, tell you this, but, but the, the, the first time that he told me that uh, um, they were gonna do their, their warm up was, was like to make up a game and and the kids just stood there because they didn't know what to do. They don't know how to do it. Well, <laughs> they didn't know how to, they didn't I did a podcast with, with Joe Ken, <laughs> and he said that, you know, these guys, they have to bring these leadership coaches into the NFL because none of them know how to take charge because they've had people do that for them forever. Right. They don't know how to do anything. They have no leadership skills because they've never played mm -hmm. on a playground and had to pick teams and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I just – it'll it'll probably get worse for a while, I think. And then – you know, there'll, there'll be enough people die um, that are making the current decisions. And then a lot of smarter people that, that are actually recognizing what makes us better. And then the school will change because school school has been a problem. I mean, the, 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 with the information age that we have now, um, the way that school is designed doesn't work, right? Um, yeah. If you look at domain knowledge, so domain knowledge is what basically, because Google knows everything. So you don't have to remember your buddy's phone number because your phone remembers it. And then if you got a question, um, Google knows the answer, right? Um, but, and so, so the kids don't need to remember anything. As long as they got an iPad sitting there, it's connected to the internet, ask them a question. Okay, do they have to even add numbers? Do they, no, of course not. Um, but they, they need to evolve some thinking skills and then they need some, some physicality to go with that to actually enhance their, their, their intellect. And so again, I think it'll, it'll suck for a while. And then eventually, like I said, it'll, it'll change enough when we realize that um, we need to just change the way that we teach kids now. And, and a big element that is gonna be the physical because people are gonna get worse. There's gonna be a lot of illness and and we're gonna to have to deal with that first, probably. Um, going back to the play that Bill mentioned, there's it's kind of interesting because some schools are actually going back to more recess, and they're finding that they have less problems in school. And there was there was one school, and I can't remember if it was in Texas or Australia. Um, they, they went back to like when I was growing up, it was a free for all. As long as you didn't kill each other, they, they didn't, you know, you could play whatever you wanted. Right. And so, um, and they've cut down the fights in the school and discipline problems, 80% they found in like the first semester. And so I know there's a couple of schools here in Apples that are going towards more and longer recesses. One of my grandsons is. I think he's fourth or fifth grade. I can't remember. I asked him the other day, I said, how much recess do you get? He goes, about 20 minutes. And then, they're let, and then they restrict what <coughs> – then they restrict what they can play. So yeah. they can't play basketball because it might exclude somebody. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it, Campo. And, you know, it's King of the Mountain, I'm definitely, I'm sure, is out. And, uh, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. And it's, it's, it's it, you know, it's, and it's, a uh, you know, it's, we have these things in Indiana called four star schools. I'm not sure what that means, but apparently it's a big deal because every, everybody that is a four star school has a big green sign up somewhere in town that says they're home of the four star schools. And so they, and, but not, none of them are, are going back to play. As a matter of fact, 
there's schools here, y'all might have it in your area, but they have like e-learning days where they don't have to go to school. They stay home all day and work on the computer. And yeah, there was, a, there was a study I shared or a, a thing I shared constantly on Facebook that the average maximum security prisoner in the United States gets more time outside than our kids do. That's, That's funny. It's funny you say that because I've got a little girl that I train. She's about, she's eight. And, uh, I got to go to HR for this, but she's larger. And, uh, and so uh, she came in yesterday and told me her doctor says she has to get an hour of play outside every day. <laughs> you think? Did, did, did they write that on a prescription pad? I, I, they, she just told me about it yesterday, so I don't know. I didn't, yeah. I didn't. That, that, that should be on the prescription pad. Yeah. The, you know? the sad thing is, is the fact that she has to be told to do that. Like, that's the thing that just blows my mind because, you know, when I was growing up, like, you literally, like, the parent, my parents had to drag us into the house when it was dark. I mean, we'd have played all night if they'd have let us. Um, it's just insane how the mentality has changed in the last 20 years. Um, it's, it's just crazy. Well, you don't have the dopamine hit of a mobile phone, which, I mean, I love playing, but the game on my phone will always beat having some exercise on my own. So it's like, it, it's yeah. so hard to overrule that. The, the rabbit hole question is, Mr. Lance, is, is that by design? That's the, that's the rabbit hole question. And right. I would argue, and I would argue, yes. You That's mean great. the mobile phone gives you the dopamine by design? Oh, all that stuff, yeah. The, oh, for the sure. Facebook, for sure. all that stuff is designed to do that it, on it purpose. Is. Did, do you know that they have created jobs called design ethicists because there's been so much research on behavioral economics and you can, you can understand what decisions will make people do stuff just by doing a little bit of research, just like we were talking about before. And they have hired people. Um, the most notable one that I know of is Tristan Harris, who used to work at Google, was hired to make sure that the stuff that they make people do subconsciously is ethical. Who decides the ethics? Some guy who studied ethics. Some guy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a collection of people. Uh, uh, Chris, the, the quote, the science progresses one funeral at a time would be Max Planck. If you uh, didn't have that one documented. <laughs> one, fact, of my, oh, that scary. one of my favorite quotes of all time. So I got a question to pose to everyone. Um, and it certainly pertains to this play topic. So I was discussing this with... Um, a bunch of my classmates and someone brought up the point of, well, if you look at developed Asian countries, they'll actually have school weeks that are six days long as, a, as opposed to five days. So they have that they're almost at like this extreme of like increasing the amount of schooling um, similar to what we're seeing with like decreasing recess and replacing it with more classes. But they're always the countries that seem to rank the highest as far as educational levels are concerned. So it's yeah, like, but they well, also have a 90% myopathy rate and most of their male population is sterile. So that might kind of, there comes the price. Okay. <laughs> They're also um, really good at testing. That's true. I mean, you can, you can, you can look it up. It's 90% of Asian, like in Japan, the myopathy in the 70s, it was about 30%. Now it's close to 90% myopic. Yeah. And their population is going backwards uh, right. because they just can't reproduce. But so then why do you think that... Because we tried to get you know, all these educational levels to rise with increasing classes. Now, you know, the Japanese were able to do that by increasing classes. They're, so so they're, they're not able, it's, it's not that, they're, that their education is better, it's that they're better at, at scoring on tests. So when you look at education levels throughout the world, they're measuring it based off of test scores. So I have the privilege to work with a lot of people from China here. 
and it's it's insane what they have to go through for test taking. Um, they're forced to read textbooks and just regurgitate what they learn, and it's math and science, and that's why they do really good on tests because so, so, they're trained. Yeah, be, so that again, we, this is one of the issues with with the with school is they're they're making people good at school. They're not making good thinkers. Right? And and also in in Japan, what they do is they pull the kids out of the system that aren't good at academics and they put them in trades. So they don't even like count them in the testing. Um, you know, the, the big thing is to look at some of the European countries that uh, I was standing in line behind. And actually my, my background is elementary education. I taught elementary school for three years and they kicked me out because they didn't like my approach. But um, so imagine that I took the kids out like every half an hour and would play for 10 minutes and then come back inside. That, that didn't get over, go over very well. But um, so you're, in Europe, they have like play-based learning up to like the third grade. Um, and then they start going into like your typical school structure, kind of like a Montessori system. Here in Kentucky, they're forcing kids to read in preschool. Um, and they, they don't have the brain development that they're supposed to get through playing and playing games and having fun and being a kid. Um, so we're forcing these kids to learn things that they don't have the the cognitive ability to actually do because they haven't done the play-based learning and they haven't been a kid. So we're forcing kids to be little adults and it's not a good long-term strategy. But are they stronger? No, not, not at all. I mean, I got kids that can't even do the jumping. I was just trying to get us back on topic. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, my little, my little uh, loaded rant, my loaded statement took us it's off. It's all right, man. No, I'm just kidding. It's like we all kind of went there, didn't we? <laughs> we somehow went from, we went from strength to an RP. Well, well, I mean, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of is relative to that because, I'm not like, when I first, <laughs> when, when I first started, when I first started, like, 20 years ago, like, you, the athletes were a lot more resilient, and today. It's, it's insane, the lack of resiliency. And, and, like, look at these kids that die in two days. Like, I got asked on a uh, – I got invited on the show to talk about strength coaches and extreme training. And, you know, this kid, they had these kids die in Maryland, and the coach just said, I was doing what I've been doing for the last 15 years. Well, the organism is different than it was 15 years ago. The kids, they're spending all summer in an air-conditioned house playing Fortnite, when I grew up, I was bailing hay all day and, and working construction. Two a days was a vacation. I mean, you couldn't kill us if you tried. Um, but it, the, the organism is completely different today. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of does the, 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 the childhood development in that is we just got less resilient people today. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't disagree I, I would agree with that because they don't play one. I know. I don't want to get back on this topic, but just real quick, Finland. Have you ever read about Finland, Jim, and their and their school uh, and their schooling? They're like the number one nation yes. in the world, and so they go to school like four or five hours a day, and every forty five minutes they get a fifteen or twenty minute outdoor break, no matter what the weather. Yep. And so, but I, I think you're right about and so getting off that topic, but I think you're right about the. Uh, um, about the kids that they don't go out, they come in the weight, they, they come to train and they're not very strong and they can't do anything. They've never done anything. They've never mowed a lawn. They've never done manual yeah. labor. I mean, that's where you build the resiliency to handle high level stress. Yeah, you so, know, I mean, I think, you know, they, 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 just, they can't, they can't literally do a push up. Yep. You know, not not even to our satisfaction. They just can't do the push up because they're not they're not strong enough. They don't have gym class, or at least in gym class they don't they don't do it. Well, they don't climb on fences or anything anymore. They just yeah. sit on their ass inside. Well, it's you know because uh, um, Bill, do you know if they're still doing the Naperville thing? I would imagine so. They had such a a big to do about it when the book came out. Yeah, okay. I don't. I don't know. I mean, so John Rady is very, very active on social media every day, 
Um, so I would imagine there's something going on. I, th I think I heard they are. I was just curious. Yeah, I would think so because again, that's that's where all the the initial testing was done, right? Well, that's that's where yeah, that's where they that's where they did the uh, uh, the thing, and they said that if they if they were if they were a country by themselves, the school system would be the number two or three ranked school system in the world, or the number two ranked educational system in the world. Lance. Yo, where are we in this? Um, well, we are hitting a time limit. I also <laughs> want Brian Chung to speak up. <laughs> I, I see him typing things that the other I'm people are watching. This. There he is. I said He's calling from the space shuttle, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think, I think it's important that you, that we don't apply the, this is the way it was lens when you're looking at this situation. Um, the organism probably hasn't really changed, but what has changed is the distribution of that organism. And so what you're seeing, it could be that, yeah, maybe the whole, the entire race of humans, right? Like the entire species of humans is on this very, you know, slow decline into nothing. I, I think that if you were to consider like the speed at which things evolve, that would be ridiculously unlikely that a gene environment interaction could change that quickly in such a short period of time when you look at the rate at which evolution has to happen for that to actually occur. Right. So, so what, is, what are some of the other reasons that this might be? Is it the fact that people aren't getting recessed, that they're less resilient? Is it the fact that there is now in some parts of the world, this huge emphasis on making sure your kid has like every single advantage that they can possibly get in their entire lives? Who are you actually seeing when you see a kid who can't do a push-up. You're seeing a kid who can afford to come to see you who can't do a push-up, right? So that's a, that's a parent, that's a familial unit that can afford to send a kid to organize sport who you are seeing and they are feeling the sort of the affluential pressure of the fact that now we have a kid we want our kid to have every advantage that they can in life. That means reading early, that means doing early, that means achieving early, and that means achieving early in multiple domains, not just in academia, right? Like every single crazy parent wants their kid to have a scholarship, right? Like, you know, like they want, like they're, they're like, my kid is going to get a, is going to get a university scholarship. And this conversation, that conversation has been had like, numerous times about what that actually means and what that likelihood is and whether that's even a good investment on a parent on a parent's part to, to say you know this is how my kid is going to get through college right so who are you actually seeing and is that composition different and is that why you're starting to see people who are showing up weaker than they should be right because it's not that it's not that that people in general aren't it's that you're actually starting to see people that would never have come to see you in the first place like you know when i was growing up well it didn't really play outside uh but we were really active because we were put like i was put into every single possible extracurricular activity you could think of right not because my parents wanted me to get a scholarship anywhere but that's because that's just what we did um, you know, I grew up in an urban environment where we didn't really necessarily have the luxury of playing outside because outside was on the street, um, you know, in an urban area, which is not the best place to play, right? So, you know, I could not, I probably couldn't do a push up when I was 12, 13, right? I could swim, but I couldn't, I couldn't push up to save my life, right? I couldn't run around the block. That's for sure. I still can't run around the block, so right. Um, so I think I think when when you apply that lens of my experience on on what it, what I'm observing, yes, it's important that you take what you have experienced and apply it. But it's you really have to be careful about how you're doing that because 
the way things were is not the way things are now. And it's not because there's a deterioration in the stock of people that this is happening, that there are probably other things that you're not necessarily seeing or considering the, the so-called confounders that are causing these relationships to form in your brain. Because you're pretty much just looking at clouds at this point and saying that looks like a teddy bear. So what you're saying is all bullshit. <laughs> Brian Chung comes into room strength conditioning again. Thanks. My byline. <laughs> there goes sports science down the tubes. <laughs> we get, if, well, I mean, if we're going to load it, we may as well load it both ways. No. I, yeah, <laughs> a very valid point. It's like we, we, we're, we're speaking from a perspective. And, and again, while it, it seems appropriately accurate for us, it's probably not the, the big picture. And, and thank you for being the, the naive expert. Brian, as you always are. That's why I keep you around, you know. <laughs> you keep me on track. Thanks. I thought you liked me, thanks. I like you <laughs> a lot. No, no, no. Uh, the, 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 seriously, uh, the, the, that's what's really important is because we're, we're all a bunch of people that, that tend to do the same kind of thing. And so our perspective is very skewed. And, and so we need, we need a little bit of that. I have a strength. I have a quick strength question for Bill. Really? Uh, I think I feel like you could or the only person that could probably answer this bill that I know. So do you, think it, do you think that it's reasonable to think that a man uh, named Bruce Wayne, who's like six foot two <laughs> and like 210, 210. So classically speaking in the comics, they say he's like six two, like two ten, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, he's jacked. Now, if he could, he reasonably bench press 600 pounds given his frame. Do you think it'd be even possible? Because in one of the comics, he does bench press like 600 pounds, I think. Well, I, I, I actually, so down the hall, I actually do have a copy of his, his workout. Um, and I think he only goes up to like 400 and some pounds. Yeah. But it's ridiculous. Oh, no, he, he misses a 600. And I remember, like, I'm trying to remember specifically, <laughs> but I think he misses a 630 pound yeah. bench press. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll scan, scan. I'll, I'll send Lance a copy of his strength workout. That we, can... <laughs> we can analyze it. <laughs> Put that in the notes. <laughs> yeah. Please. Doesn't his he would find a way. He would find a way. Doesn't his suit have some sort of extra skeletal strength kind of deal to it? I mean, it's potentially he could be using some sort of like assistance from the suit, but this is just raw Bruce Wayne power we're talking about here. Oh, sorry, strength. The topic is strength. Is that the is that the real Bruce Wayne, or is that all these fake ones that they come out in these movies? <laughs> hey, are we talking about Adam West? Who who are you referring to as the real Bruce Wayne? Hey, who who had the better barrel chest? I mean, oh uh, yeah, well, that was like who's the original? Who's the uh, who's the black and white one? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, he had a he had a big old chest. Yeah, Lance, look that up and put it in the notes. <laughs> On it. Yeah, Bill. Bill, who's your favorite? Who's your favorite Batman? That this is a good question. You you mean like in the in the the media kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, like in the movies and all that. Who's your who's your favorite one? Um, Choose I, wisely. <laughs> I, I I have a I have a small bias for for very good reasons towards Ben Affleck, and it's not because of of Ben Affleck the actor. It's because of his representation of it, and uh, then the the single most exceptionally done fight scene in the history of cinema. <laughs> um, what? Love in, that. Ba in Batman versus Superman. That was it. Was like the best. It was like as close to a comic book fight scene as you could get. I mean, it was really, it was pretty good. It was it was really really well done. That was a screw job of epic proportions. <laughs> <laughs> You're just angry because I made you go. <laughs> no, Superman does not job to Batman. <laughs> He's shorter. Kryptonite doesn't, doesn't matter. Oh gosh! All right. I think with the conversation is generating. <laughs> it's, it's we're being yeah. derailed. Sorry, sorry. I just completely derailed it. <laughs> Tony, I, just took, uh, I took Brian's thunder. Sorry, Brian. Tony put up a nice Cora question. How much do you think Batman can lift? 
bit based on the comic book strip. They actually posted the comic book strip of him benching 405. Wait, are you allowed on this call? Nice <laughs> 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 shirt, Tony. Nice shirt. Good save. Wow. That was a good save. That, dad almost kicked me out. Oh, God. <laughs> Hi, Tony. I miss you. Miss you too, Bill. <laughs> now I do. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. He's Tony, that looks like 455, man. Look at the look at the uh, cells later on. Let's see it. Did it does it change plates mid mid rack? Well, no. I think I think that look look it's four plates and then it looks like a 25, uh, right? Five, Maybe they're bumpers. They're kilos. Yeah, five, 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 yeah. yeah. You got reading it. Yeah. 20, yeah. Oh yeah, then the 25s. Yeah, I missed that. He's got a couple of sandbags in his face too. That's strange. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well played. Yeah. So it's that's, kind of a, that's kind of a narrow grip, too. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh. Sorry to derail. Yeah. Yeah. Just answering the important questions. All right. Hey, that was pretty good, though, in general. I thought it went well. Yeah, I'm a... Uh... You know, we've, we've been talking about doing the topic thing for a while, and I'm reading a book about creative constraints and how they actually make things better. And I think uh, this this helped us a little bit. It gave us a little direction. So. Right. Constraint, but and you know what? Constraints in general are, are nothing to be concerned about because um, we all have them. And, and again, if, if I can deviate back to actually something that might be tad useful is like when we're talking about clients and such, that like they walk in with constraints. And, and th those are what we work within always, right? It's not, it's not necessarily what we want to do, but it's what you have to do. You have to adapt. So anyway, but I like the idea. I, th I think it works a little bit better um, to, to, to do it this way, but um, we probably need a stronger moderator. Yes. What I mean, what do you need me to do? I can well, hire Tony to break I mean, those fingers. Well, well, I, I, while I enjoyed the discussion, it, it, it really deviated, you know, that last quarter of it was like, you know, it was fun and interesting. It really was. Sorry, it was my fault. I take full responsibility. It, it is. It is not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It, it's. It, no, like I said, I I, I I enjoy that stuff. But 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 um, from a a uh, watcher perspective, like somebody that's watching this video to to pick up anything that, that useful, um, it was off top. It was we 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 deviated off topic. But again, that stuff like that happens. But um, it was fun. And it got Brian Chung in the room. So, you know, anything that brings Brian Chung in the room, I am all for. I'm like almost always in the room. I never see you though. So you're not on my screen. I think I have to do this. And then maybe I can see, it. there he is. There it is. Corey Hecht is here. I didn't see him the whole time. He didn't talk or anything. Okay. Good to see him, man. He must have enough strength. Yes. Whatever that means. Definitely not. Whatever that means, I would say it depends. Thank you guys for coming out. I'm going to kill this recording now.